All right, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, welcome everybody to the first Third Friday lecture for 2024. We're really glad to have you back joining us. Um, other programs coming up in March, we're going to have, you think, a uh, really interesting program on the, some of the more impressive life-saving service rescues on Lower Lake Michigan. So they're fabulous stories, so please make sure you're here for March. Uh, we'll be getting our February one posted soon, so watch your email for that. And also the last Wednesday of this month, another one of our great uh, employees here, Dante, is going to be giving a presentation at the Underwater Archaeological Society. You're welcome to join us in person or online for that. Just look up uaschicago.org to find it online. He'll be presenting on uh, some early boat construction. So, to get started, for those of you who haven't been here lately, we're really happy to have a new curator. Uh, she's been great. She's a Chicago historian. She's had a lot of experience curating at other facilities around the city, and she's doing a great job here so far. So please welcome Madeline Fitzell. Hello, everybody. Welcome to what I hope will be my first of many of these Third Friday talks. I want to uh, thank everyone who braved the cold to come out here tonight. To also thank Kath and our volunteers for the soup and cider that's keeping us warm. And to thank everyone who's joining from home as well. I'm sorry that this is the view of my face you're going to have this whole time. So I'm going to try and leave us plenty of time at the end for questions. So make sure you come up with a lot of them. But to start with, I'm very excited to introduce the collection, I think I'm sorry, I need to move more computers. Okay. I'm very excited to talk to you about the museum's recent acquisition of the Philip R. May collection. Philip R. May, who you can see in several pictures here, is a native Chicagoan with a lifelong interest in the Great Lakes and all things maritime. He was a chief engineer and lieutenant in the U.S. Navy for four years, a Commodore of Belmont Harbor for the Belmont Yacht Club, and has been a Great Lakes sailor for more than 60 years. His collection of maritime art and artifacts arrived at the museum this December with the help of his wife, Anne. And I want to begin my presentation by thanking the entire May family for their generosity. Before the end of the month, we'll be opening a special temporary exhibition featuring some of the other objects that came to the museum as part of the May collection. Now, as a curator, typically when I put together exhibitions, the objects in the same room are all going to have something in common. They're all from the same time period. They're all from the same place. One of the exciting things about doing an exhibition around the collection from one person is that the only thing they have in common is that they were in that same collection. So you get to get a sense of the person who collected the objects, what their interests were, but also in standing in the gallery and seeing objects from all over the world, from different periods of time, it helps us look at all of those objects differently by throwing them in comparison with each other. And in the May collection, we have objects that range from this mid 19th century English painting of the Bark Panthea, the Panthea was built in 1856 on Prince Edward Island in Canada and uh, disappears from the register by 1865. So something happened there. Uh, this painting of the Panthea was done by Richard B. Spencer, an English maritime artist who was active from 1840 to 1874, who rarely exhibited. He worked directly with uh, people who commissioned him to do uh, ship portraits and also uh, paintings of naval battles. Now, presumably, this piece was also a commission, and I include the detail there, of the figurehead on the ship, a mermaid, as you can see, to give you an idea of the level of detail in the painting. Also coming to us from the May collection is this statometer. This was produced by an American company in 1941 for the U.S. Navy. A number of different American companies who had other uh, things they built during peacetime switched to the war effort during World War II. The company that produced this statometer normally produces drafting implements. And besides just the statometer itself, we also have its case and the original naval instructions for people who would have been using it. 
Now, what I'm here to talk to you about today are these five paintings. Now, immediately when I went to view the collection, I, I thought everything was interesting, but I gravitated towards these five paintings. You can see them here immediately before and after their trip to the museum. Now, here are each of the five paintings in a little more detail. This one is in the foreground, uh, has piles of coal, tugboats and, and ships, uh, steamers on the river billowing up smoke, the reflections and ripples in the water and the smoke all joined to make one sort of smoggy atmosphere, the only pops of color being the red on the tugboat funnels and the red brown at the bricks. There's this one which shows part of the deck where the painter was likely situated when he did the pieces, probably on plein air, painted on site. This one also features a bit of the Chicago landscape, the skyline, where the funnels that are billowing smoke blend into in the background the steeples from cathedrals and churches, which are echoed then by the boats in the foreground and the two little plinths on the deck. We have this one, which is more vertical, but with a lot of the same themes. This one is split almost in the middle with the sky and the boats and the top with the smoke, but with a very impressionistic water scene in the lower half giving you the idea that these ripples and reflections on the water are just as important as the boats above. There's this one, which I particularly like because you can see two of the bridges in the background, another very impressionistic, loosely painted view. And then finally, this one, which compared to the other four is a riot of color. The paddle steamer in the foreground, you can see its wheel and buildings of different colored bricks, including one that has a painted advertisement are in the background. Now, I'm gonna show you this detail, which is from the first, the very smoky painting that I started with, to give you an idea of the three-dimensionality of these pieces. It's very thick paint, very visible brush strokes, Similar to if you've ever seen a work by Van Gogh produced on paper, nothing like seeing the work on a wall where you can see the three dimensionality of the paint. Now, I've reproduced this detail specifically because it's one of the only places in the artist's work and the only place in our five paintings where you see a human figure. You can see there's a little band pointing on the end of one of those boats. Now here are the five paintings as a group, roughly to scale. One thing that you may have noticed as we went through the five is that they're all unsigned. Now, of course, this makes my job as a curator a little trickier, a little less tricky though, because Philip R. May did do initial research into the attribution of the painting and had identified a local black artist who worked as a house painter as their possible creator, but hadn't yet turned up a name. Now, by the types of ships you can see in the paintings, by the glimpses you get of Chicago's buildings and infrastructures, was able to narrow them down to the late 19th or early 20th century. They're all oil paintings. They all share that same impressionistic style, and a clear interest in maritime subjects. So I started searching for other artists who were active in Chicago at this time, who were painting the Chicago River in this impressionistic style. And I found these four paintings. So my searches led me to the M. Christine Schwartz collection. In 2007, Chris Schwartz purchased a group of 36 paintings by local Chicago artists to prevent the collection from being dispersed out of state. The paintings were then donated to different Chicago institutions and completely coincidentally, we got a different one. So I'll talk about this later, but over the last summer, the M. Christine Schwartz collection donated to us a painting of Goose Island from 1898 by a French painter who I'll talk about. Now, um, let's see, the four paintings that you see here were attributed to an artist, James Boulevard Needham, and all four were donated to the Art Institute of Chicago. Now, here are our four or our five paintings with the four that have been attributed. And I'm gonna caution you that I am definitely not a photographer at the scale of the person photographing the Chris Schwartz collection. And you can see still though, similarities in color, in composition, in subject and in style. 
Like ours, the four attributed paintings are unsigned. Now, like I said, the artist of those four attributed paintings is confirmed to be James Bolivar Needham. He was born in 1850 in Chatham, Ontario and died in 1931 in Chicago. And I'll get much more into who Needham was and how he wound up painting views of the Chicago River, but first wanna show you one other clue I had to the painting's attribution which you haven't seen yet because I cropped it out of the photo. <laughs> this. So this is a whole view of how that small, very colorful painting was framed. You can see that some of the wood panel around its edges are visible. Now, I'm gonna zoom in to some of the details on that wood paneling. We know that James Bolivar Needham used pieces of shipping crates that would have been plentiful in Chicago's dock as the wood panels for his paintings. And you can see that the wood panel behind our painting shows signs of nails and slats that would have made up a shipping crate, just like the ones we know he cut down to size to use for his paintings. So I'm currently putting forth a possible attribution to R5 by James Bolivar Needham. But once the exhibition is over, we're gonna dismantle the frames that are in to see whether he carved in verso uh, his signature and also where the paintings were executed. You almost always put a location or a year on the backs of his paintings. So who was James Bolivar Needham? This is Wilbert Siebert's map of the most popular routes for people escaping slavery on the Underground Railroad. He drew it in 1898 based on letters and interviews with abolitionists and people who traveled the routes. As an aside about the map, one thing that you can probably notice is how central waterways were to people seeking freedom. For a lot of those red lines, a waterway makes up all or part of the route. Now, the reason I've included it is you'll see how many routes, whether up through Lake Michigan and down Lake Huron, across Lake Erie, end up in the area of Ontario where Chatham is. And you can see on the map, on that peninsula right across from Detroit, Chatham, Ontario is specifically called out. This is because Chatham was considered by many the terminus end of the Midwestern routes of the Underground Railroad. It was an incredibly popular destination for people seeking freedom. And by the 1850s, when James Bolivar Needham was born, it was called the Black Mecca of Canada. James Bolivar Needham was Black, and although we don't know much about his family history, the fact that he was born in Chatham in 1850, and the fact that his middle name is honoring Simon Bolivar, the liberator of six South American countries, suggests that his parents at least had abolitionist leanings. So, you know, it's very possible that they traveled the Underground Railroad themselves. At age 14, James joined his older brother working on Great Lakes lumber barges. These aren't photos from uh, James Boulevard Needham's lumber barge, just similar ones from a similar time that are part of our collection, the Newell Archival Photograph Collection, which you can call up as a researcher and see anytime at the museum. The mini map. So uh, he worked on these lumber barges for about three years as a deckhand across the Great Lake. And in the late 1860s, at this point, he would have been in his late teens. The Civil War is over, slavery has been abolished, the Fugitive Slave Act, which could have possibly brought him or his family members back into slavery, had ended. And so in the late 1860s, he settles permanently here in Chicago. We don't know much about his early life in Chicago, but we know that some of his first jobs, he was a porter at the Sherman House Hotel on Randolph and Clark and worked in some kind of similar capacity at the Carson Curry Scott department store, which you can see there. In 1893, Needham was part of the team that painted the buildings at the Chicago World's Fair. It's possible that this is where his house painting work began. And we know that it was around this period that he also started painting his views of the Chicago River. We think that James Bolivar Needham was largely self-taught but it's possible that it's through his uh, work with the fair that he met this man, Laredo Taft, the great Chicago sculptor. Now, Laredo Taft was a prominent Chicago sculptor who studied in Paris and taught at the Art Institute from 1886 until 1929. 
TAPS was known for promoting arts education for people who are traditionally left out of the arts academy. When Daniel Burnham expressed concern that the sculptural elements of the horticultural building at the World's Fair wouldn't be finished, uh, Taft asked him whether he could employ women as some of the sculptors on the team working to complete them. Burnham famously said, you can employ white rabbits as long as they get the job done. <laughs> the team of lady sculptors who he uh, hired, called of course the white rabbits ever after, became some of the most influential sculptors of the next generation. Now, Needham's brother said that while James had largely been self-taught, he may have taken some classes at the Art Institute and worked with Laredo Taft. The Art Institute doesn't have any records of Needham officially taking classes through them, but it's entirely possible that he worked with Taft directly. We know Taft was an admirer of Needham's work. Laredo Taft was active in the Central Arts Association, which exhibited the work of modern Midwestern artists at places like the Art Institute here in Chicago, but their mission was to put on these exhibitions of modern Midwestern art in small Midwestern cities across the region, ordinarily which wouldn't have art exhibitions. In 1896, one of Needham's paintings was selected for one of these traveling Central Arts Association exhibitions. As far as we know, this was the only time that Needham's work was exhibited publicly during his lifetime. It's been suggested by scholars that James Bolivar Needham may have also studied with this man, Albert Fleury, who painted the work to the right there, Goose Island. This is, of course, that 1898 painting that we got from the uh, Christine Schwartz collection, which we are going to be exhibiting as part of the temporary exhibition alongside the Needham painting. Albert Fleury was born in the French port of Le Havre, in, uh, oh God, I forgot the year, in the 1860s. And he arrived in Chicago in the late 1880s to paint murals in Denkmar Adler and Louis Sullivan's auditorium building. He felt that the industry on Chicago's waterways added to the city's vitality and wrote that he was shocked that Chicagoans found their city so gloomy and grimy when he and his French artist friends found it, quote, so strange and so picturesque. In flurry scenes of the city, he tried to communicate what he found so beautiful about, in his words, the maritime, industrial, and commercial aspects of Chicago. In 1900, when he was exhibiting his own work in Chicago of uh, scenes like this on the river, he wrote in the Chicago Arts Journal, Brush and Pencil, that Goose Island, again the view that you see here, is a striking point. The great coal elevators where every few moments the numerous tugs repair for their daily diet give an impression of great maritime activity. This is the smokiest corner of Chicago. One can hardly distinguish the world around him or untangle the framework of derricks which cross like the branches of trees. Now, as to whether Needham studied with Flurry, we just can't know. There are obvious similarities, though, in composition and choice of subject. Both display an interest in replicating smoke, smog, clouds, the reflection and ripples on choppy water. However, Needham's painting, as you can see here, is much looser and more impressionistic than Fleury's painting is. Abel Fleury was taught in the traditional French academic system, and it's possible that Needham being self-taught gave him a freer hand when it came to depicting the scene. When Fleury had a major exhibition of his work in Chicago in the early 1900s, art critics bemoaned our lack of local talent in depicting the urban landscape. Many of the headlines said something along the lines of it took someone from France for us to appreciate Chicago's uh, urban <laughs> landscape. Now, I'm returning to this Needham painting, one of the first I showed you, because it's a shame that he wasn't being recognized in that period as being homegrown, and I know he lived in Canada until he was 17, but many Chicagoans come from other places. But he wasn't recognized as a homegrown impressionist who depicted uniquely Chicago landscapes with the river and its industry as completely central to his paintings, just as central as it was to city life. 
Now compare this photo I took, a very close up of the water in one of Monet's monumental water lilies paintings at the Orangerie in Paris, with the water in that Needham painting that I just showed you. He was working in a style that would have been considered avant-garde in France at the same time, as far as we know, without ever having left the Great Lakes area, although clearly with his own unique taste. Needham died in 1931 at the age of 81 from smoke inhalation after the studio where he stored his paintings caught fire. He's able to save some of them, but not his own life. And this is the way, if he's been interpreted, he's largely been interpreted as a Chicago Impressionist. In the few exhibitions of his work since his death, he's been looked at in the context of Chicago and modern art. Now, I would argue that at the Maritime Museum, we have a unique opportunity to tell James Boulevard Needham's story in a more holistic way. To understand the centrality of waterways in his artwork from the subjects they depict to the very shipping crates that they were made of, we have to understand the centrality of waterways to Needham's life. At every stage from his parents' flight on the Underground Railroad to his work as a deckhand, his plein air painting on the docks of Chicago, Needham's life revolved around water. Again, I want to thank Philip R. May and the May family for making it possible for the museum to tell this story, but the story does not end tonight. So make sure you come back before the end of the month. We'll have an exhibition staged in this space here in the South Gallery, where you'll be able to look at these paintings in person. And I hope you'll follow along with the museum as we explore what's on the back of them and learn more about this history. And now I'll open the floor for questions. Thanks everyone very much. <laughs> Did the May family tell you how Richard acquired the paintings and did he get them all at the same time? Uh, Philip, um, how Philip uh, acquired the paintings. <laughs> they were purchased all together, but the person, the, the auction house where they were purchased from also didn't have any provenance information for the paintings. So uh, by the way, his attribution of them to a black house painter was correct. James Boulevard Needham later in his life worked as a house painter and also as a janitor on different estates on the north side. Please repeat the question when for the next one. Oh, so the question was uh, whether Philip got all of the paintings at the same time and from where he got them. Do we have any other questions in house or at home? It looks like there's a hand being raised on the Zoom, Jim. Yeah. And if you want to go ahead and ask, I think we can hear you. He, no, no, I turn my can you hear me, Madeline? He's not muted. I am. Okay, try again. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. He did get them all at the same time. This is Anne I'm May, Philip's wife, confirming that he got them all at the same time. He did. <laughs> and Thank he you, bought Anne. them at an auction. Bought them at an auction. Thank you for coming too, by the way. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Another question? Um, I'm just wondering, I live in London, I'm just wondering where exactly you see the description of the place and what source, and also if Chicago is that maybe the towns are shipping than it used to be because I've been here only a bit, but I don't, I haven't seen. Like so we have a question from a Californian about where these paintings may have been done on the Chicago River and whether that busyness, uh, you know, whether Chicago is less busy of a port than it looks in these paintings. So uh, to answer your first question, we don't know exactly where the paintings were done. We do know that Needham worked on plein air and he painted real things he saw, just impressionistically. So at one point as part of this larger project, along with going down to see the Laredo Taft archives at the University of Illinois to see whether he wrote anything about Needham's work that we don't know, I wanna try and situate all of these paintings on the river. Now, I think some of them probably were done in that same Goose Island area on the North Branch where Fleury painted because it would have been a heavily industrial area and like he said, very smoky, but some of them may have been down here. I mean, 
things like the bridges and the buildings are going to help us figure that out. But he also may have carved into the back of them exactly where they were done. So that's one thing we may be learning. As to the busyness of Chicago's waterways, that has changed considerably. So after the Port of Chicago was open, most of the heavy industry on shipping on the waterways moved to Lake Calumet, the Calumet Harbor on the far southeast side of the city. When the St. Lawrence Seaway opened in 1959, all of that Atlantic international travel that's coming to Chicago goes straight down there. So if you ever look at the horizon of Lake Michigan and see big freighters and ships, they're still coming just, you know, for the people at home, there are some photos of Chicago's waterways in the gallery. You can walk around later and see the size of these huge ships in the Chicago River and it's hard to imagine. At times, Chicago in the 19th century was the busiest port in the country. And at times it was one of the busiest port in the world. It's still a very busy port, just nowhere near as busy as it would have been back when we were the crossroads of the country. We still are, but waterways are a little less important for that now. Good question. We have a couple online questions. Great. Mary and Elizabeth writes, have the Schwartz collection paintings been restored and is that why they look lighter? Yes, I think probably that's one of the reasons that you can see the lightness of the grays a little bit more is that the Schwartz collection went through restoration. I should also caution though, a lot of it is my photographs of them. They're a little yellower in my pictures than they look in person and as the lighting in my office. <laughs> you got one more? Also, I'm not sure how well my voice is being picked up. Okay. So is Philip the same Philip Mays who is a former board member? Sarah. I didn't former know. Member, former board, I, board member of what? Of the museum, I think. Did you know he was the board member of the museum, Anne? I didn't I, think so. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I I don't know that. It's possible, but I don't know it. Anne says she doesn't know, but it's possible that she doesn't know. Whether Philip Arme was a board member here. He was certainly interested in the museum. Sorry? Online, we are hearing okay. from the back, so we're good. Are you ready? Yeah. A question up here? Are there any um, writings by Needham that have survived in archives or just the painting? Not that we know of, but that's something that I want to do some digging. I mean, because. <clears throat> He lost his life in a studio fire, and I assume that any papers and things that were he may have written about his paintings may have been lost too. But as part of our acquisition of these paintings, I definitely want to be doing more work into Needham's life and hopefully turn up something interesting. Do you know where his studio was? No, I don't. I, it was somewhere on the north side, but I'm not sure exactly where. Where his studio was, was the question. Also, good Sarah online comments that uh, Philip May was involved in marketing. That helps us figure out if he. That sounds right, Anne. What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. That Philip May was involved in marketing for the museum. Yes, he he possibly was. He was. He worked at Kramer Crassold, and he was the head of direct marketing, and he certainly could have been. Certainly could have been. Yes, uh, behind you. Oh. The uh, photograph you have of the guys working the, the timber. Ship. Yeah, the lumber. I'll go back to one of them there. Yeah, that one. Do we know where the other was? North Manitou Island in Michigan. Oh, okay. The Newell collection, uh, they were a family that summered in North Manitou Island and had stakes in the lumber industry. So there are a lot of really excellent photos of the lumber being stacked on the ships, on the barges, and on the shores. Yes? I have, so, wonderful presentation. I'm not an art historian, but I've seen a lot of art heist movies and stuff <laughs> like this. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if there's a way to scientifically relate the TMM-5 to the, the take the provenance of the, is there a way to take an analysis? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you that? could, carbon dating, I mean, we know roughly when they're right. all from, and but may not be super accurate. yeah, you can definitely like do paint right. analysis to make sure that the paint, the chemicals of the paints used in the attributed ones are the chemicals in the paints used in ours. But the way they attributed theirs was finding a signature on the back. Right. 
Okay. So that'll show us a lot. He didn't sign all of his pieces. So we'll, we're gonna continue to do the search into making a positive attribution. Yes. Well, there are several people who know when the traffic moves off the main branch of the Chicago River down the Lake Gallion Mountain. Yeah, it was just getting too crowded in right. the loop area. Well, I'm the a comment about how you know how crowded the the boat traffic was getting in the loop. And you look at some of the photos of those huge shipping uh, boats in the river and you don't understand how they can turn around. And it looks like they'd have to make a 90 point turn to get anywhere. So you can certainly understand when you see the scale of the boat versus the scale of the Chicago River, why the traffic moved. <laughs> Sable Harbor now was a turning base. Oh, other people were asking you to repeat the question. So. Uh, the question, it was a, a comment about how the river traffic, or the river is um, got very busy and the traffic moved down to Lake Calumet, and then a comment about how the Sable Harbor was a turning base. Do we have any other questions for me in person or at home? Yes. Oh, if you want to wrap up the question. I was just wondering about you had mentioned one of these pictures. There's only one small man who can point to something. I was wondering if you had any comments or thoughts or anything about the absence of human uh, evidence in these paintings. So I it's a a question on the little human figure I showed and why there's a lack of, of human figures in the other paintings. Only it's only him as far as we can see. Well, it's an interesting question because I mean, the paintings show a lot of evidence of humans, just no actual humans. I mean, besides the actual water, it's an entirely man-made landscape that you're looking at. And there's an implication of people there's certainly someone on that boat shoveling coal to make all that steam billow up. There's certainly someone who's piloting it down the river, but you're not seeing them. Now, in a way that's taking a page, I think from the book of impressionism, where you're seeing a sunset, you're seeing a dock, you're seeing haystacks. But you know, when you're seeing a landscape, it's not as often that you're seeing people in it. But whereas in an Impressionist piece, you might be looking at a, a haystack and a natural landscape, in uh, Needham's work, you're looking at man-made landscapes, just without the men. I'd like to throw in the Chicago River as a man-made landscape. That's a good point. The Chicago River itself is part of what's man-made. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a, a very man-made landscape is right. Yes, one last or two, two last questions. Are you aware of needing every many relatives alive still in the city? We don't know. He had siblings, but he we don't know as, that he had children. We don't know whether his siblings have children, but also I, I'm, I'm not saying we don't know that because it's not knowable. We don't know that because as far as I know, nobody's done that research yet. So hopefully that'll be one of the things that we'll be figuring out is we'll be able to put together a bit more of a detailed biography of him. Yes. Can you zoom in on the fourth picture from the left? This one? Yeah. Uh, a question on zooming in on this picture. Are there two bridges? Together, it's yeah, it's two bridges. So I, I'm wondering if we're looking at maybe the tip of Goose Island there. I, I don't know. But it's yes, we're definitely looking at two bridges. It looks sort of familiar. Yeah, well, that's I mean the effect that I think a lot of the pieces have. There's a familiarity to them because the Chicago River landscape is familiar. And I think something that's interesting about the pieces is while they're instantly familiar, you can't tell exactly where they were done. You have a familiarity of the Chicago River landscape, but there's no one landmark that you can point to. 
the way that Fleury's painting of Goose Island was obviously a painting of Goose Island. Well, that will wrap up our question portion, unless there's one online. No, nope. I just want to share one thing that at the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History, we've been developing a database for Great Lakes artwork, and that's available online. I'm sorry, I don't know the address off the top of my head, but if you're interested in seeing that, it has artwork from all the maritime museums around the Great Lakes listed on it, and that'll have like work with you to get our stuff. Absolutely, out. yeah. But if anybody wants to get the link to that, let us come here to the museum and we'll get that for you. Well, everyone, thank you very much thank for attending. You. And thank you online, everybody. Thank you, Anne. <laughs>